Well, it's good to see you on this uh, Friday afternoon. And uh, I was asked to write a piece which will be at foxnews.com uh, and will also be the newsletter that you can get if you want to sign up for free at GingrichProductions.com. And the, I was asked to reflect on 15 years after 9-11. And it's a topic I've thought a lot about. It's a topic I worry a lot about. And I decided finally to be pretty direct and pretty stark in saying that we need to talk about is defeat, dishonesty, and humiliation at the strategic level. And let me make this very clear because uh, some of my critics will come back and say, well, how can you talk about American troops being defeated? I'm not. American troops have been very courageous. They've, they've won virtually every firefight they've been in. Uh, they've done everything they've been asked to do. But a mound of tactics is not a strategy. Successfully winning small fights doesn't mean winning a war. And I'll let you judge for yourself. The fact is, if you go back to 9-11, and you look at President Bush's joint session speech nine days later on September 20th, he outlined a real campaign. It was, it was the boldest, the most decisive statement of the war we're in that any president has given. He came back four months later in the uh, State of the Union address, and that's where he described uh, what he called an axis of evil. He listed North Korea, Iran, and Iraq. He talked about the need for us to wage a campaign uh, that he said we're not going to let uh, the most dangerous countries in the world use the most devastating weapons in the world. And there was a huge round of applause. But there was a problem. And it's a problem which some of us began raising as early as 9-11 and 9-12. Um, I felt strongly, and in retrospect, very strongly that we had to be prepared to declare war. That there, there are very practical reasons why a declaration of war changes the environment you're in. And we needed to declare war on uh, the entire movement of uh, Islamic supremacism, which Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS, uh, the Taliban, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, uh, all sorts of groups. But the lawyers convinced the president not to do that. And that tied our hands in many ways because it got us into uh, what is essentially a civilian environment. Now, the second place was that the president was being pretty clear about what we had to do. And I actually think if you read George W. Bush's speech on September 20th, 2001, to the Joint Session of Congress, and then you read the opening sections on national security in his State of the Union in 2002. It's a pretty darn good case of what we should have done. The problem was that the Bush administration didn't understand how big the problem was. They didn't understand how difficult it was going to be. And as a general rule, they weren't prepared to take on the bureaucracies in Washington. The State Department didn't believe in the strategy. Uh, from day one. The State Department wasn't designed to implement the strategy. It's really not an operational department. It's a representational department. It talks, but it doesn't necessarily get things done. This was obvious in Afghanistan as early as the uh, spring and summer of 2002. Um, what you had was one relatively effective operational arm called the Defense Department, one uh, remarkably knowledgeable operational arm called the Intel Central Intelligence Agency. And then you fell off a cliff. And we found ourselves with problems. Now, there are a couple of additional factors. The military, for long-term historic reasons, did not want to reshape itself into a force designed to defeat uh, Islamic supremacism at the expense of its other assignments. Uh, it saw itself with an assignment in South Korea, an assignment in Europe, with a general uh, expeditionary force assignment. And so the institutional military found it very difficult to reshape and rethink what it was doing. And the Bush administration did not want to ask for the size buildup that we probably really should have had. We, we were probably 40% too small to do all the things we were trying to do. 
you really see this if you uh, read Jake Tapper's remarkable book, uh, The Outpost. Uh, Tapper, who's now at CNN, uh, spent, I think, a year working on a detailed day-by-day -day account of what happened at one particular outpost in Afghanistan. And what comes through very clearly is that we had, as soon as we defeated the Taliban in Afghanistan, we had begun withdrawing forces so that we had people out on the edge of the spear, if you will, with uh, too little reinforcement, too little logistics, too little help. Uh, and it's terrible. You, uh, you read this book and you think, how could the most powerful nation in the world subject young men and women to this kind of lack of support? But that's part of what was going on because people didn't want to take seriously how big it was, how difficult it was, how much effort it would take. Now, there's a further problem. Uh, President George W. Bush very powerfully and very emotionally said uh, to countries around the world, you're either with us or you're against us. The State Department promptly began turning that into, well, you can be sort of with us and sort of against us at the same time. So take the case of Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan's a very complicated, very difficult country. It's also a dangerous country. It's dangerous first because it has a lot of nuclear weapons largely aimed at India, but nonetheless, it has a lot of nuclear weapons. It's dangerous, second, because it was a primary supply line through which we were shipping things to Afghanistan. So if we got in a really big fight with the Pakistanis, our challenge of getting things in was going to get worse. And remember, the other places you could bring things in from were Central Asia through Russia, so now you have the challenge with Putin, and Iran, which clearly we couldn't do very, we couldn't rely on. So, in a way, the State Department had this terrible problem. On the one hand, when the Taliban was defeated in Afghanistan, it retreated across the border. Now, the Taliban is, is in fact, uh, largely from one ethnic language group, and they exist on both sides of the Pakistani border. So they don't think of themselves automatically as Afghans versus Pakistanis. And the result is the Taliban can literally have a gigantic sanctuary in northwest uh, Pakistan. Now, one of the lessons we clearly learned in Vietnam, and, and we've known this over the years, is any guerrilla movement with a sanctuary where it can go hide, rest, get restructured, has an enormous advantage. And so here we were with our hands tied. On the one hand, we're not going to cross over and clean out all of the Taliban elements that were in northwest Pakistan. On the other hand, the Pakistanis weren't going to do it. They didn't, there would be a huge, terrible war for them. Um, and we had to be very careful because you're dealing with a country with nuclear weapons. And you're relying on them for your logistics system to get supplies in and out. All of these things were coming together simultaneously. And the result was a mess. So as I talked to you, I just literally 20 minutes ago read that the Taliban has launched an assault to try to capture a provincial capital, which if they succeed will be the first time since we got there in 2001 that they have successfully captured a city. And the Taliban is on the way back. Don't kid yourself. The morning we leave, they're one, two, three weeks away from taking over because the current government is too corrupt. It is too shallow. We have tolerated uh, things that don't work. We've failed to supply adequate power to, to change play, the place, and the State Department has been totally incapable of the kind of massive <clears throat> infrastructure building program you really need. Afghanistan is the kind of country where if you build enough highways and you put in enough facilities, you really could radically change the country in a very short time. Uh, but we didn't. We weren't capable of it. We were trying to do it on the cheap, and the result is that uh, the people of Afghanistan are in grave danger of going back into a religious dictatorship that will be extraordinarily hostile to the West. Meanwhile, you have Iraq, which is now a total mess. We went in with one set of ideas, which was that we would go quickly, we would defeat Saddam, we would replace Saddam, and we'd have a very limited American presence. However, once we got there, President Bush sent Ambassador Bremer and Ambassador Bremer had a totally different idea, almost like MacArthur in Japan. He was going to redesign and reshape Iraq. Well, countries are really hard to redesign and reshape. There are a lot of deep complexities in Iraqi culture. 
there are Shia in the East who actually would much prefer dealing with Iran uh, to dealing, say, with Saudi Arabia. There are Sunnis in the West who would much prefer to deal with Saudi Arabia rather than deal with Iran. There are Kurds in the North who just want their own country uh, and have a long history going back 2,000 years of living in the mountains, being attacked by everybody else and surviving because they're remarkably tough mountain people. And in many ways, the Kurds were the most pro-American, partially because we were outsiders and they, they figured we weren't going to stay. So all of these things are going on simultaneously. And in that setting, we put in enough forces to defeat Saddam, but not enough forces to run the country. If we were going to follow Bremer's strategy, then we should have listened to Army Chief of Staff Shinseki, who had testified in Congress that to truly occupy all of Iraq took at least 500,000 men. That's three times the number we were prepared to put in. So we ended up in a mess. We went back with a surge, uh, which was a courageous decision by President George W. Bush. But the surge in the end was, was a, a short-term tactical device. The fact was we had an Iraqi government that had its own agenda, that was far more afraid of the Iranians than it was of us, and that in the long run wanted us to leave. And that Iraqi government was largely Shia dominated. And so the Sunnis in the west of Iraq went into rebellion. And the result has been a continuing violent area. Uh, and so while we claimed we were going in to do something good, you have an Iraq today which is much more dominated by the Iranians than it is by us. You have an Iraq today which is really divided deeply, and in the West the power vacuum led to the rise of ISIS, much of which was fueled by former members of uh, Saddam Hussein's army who felt that they had been uh, isolated and alienated and that they had to protect themselves against the Shia in the East. That's the mess we have in Iraq today. And by the way, as an example of why I include the word dishonesty, it's all this political talk about boots on the ground. We have, I think, over 4,600 American soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, currently in Iraq. Over 4,600, not counting people who come in temporarily. So to say we're not going to have boots on the ground is just, I mean, it's really an insult to people who are risking their lives every single day trying to help in that country. So here's my summary point. If you go back and you read George W. Bush's two great speeches, and then you say to yourself, all right, Iran, which he correctly identifies, is part of the axis of evil. And then you say, but we just sent them a billion seven hundred million dollars in currency in a series of airlifts which were apparently in planes carried by the Iraqi the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, as though it was a drug run. I mean Think about walking onto a plane that has $400 million in cash sitting on it. That was seen by the Iranians as tribute. And that did not increase their affection for us. I think as a, the degree to which our humiliation, we've gone from being the decisive dominant power in the region to being timid, confused, uh, underprepared, underarmed, underequipped. And the result is, for example, at the very time we're paying them, a billion, seven hundred million dollars, their Navy ships are coming very close to our ships and, and playing games with us. And I think our timidity in reacting to that is part of why you now have Russian aircraft, one of which the other day came within 10 feet of an American aircraft. Uh, we're being taunted, humiliated, and our leadership at the establishment level can't tell the truth. In fact, the administration tried lying to the Congress and the public about the money being sent to Iran until the Wall Street Journal did investigative work and found out exactly what was happening. So my report to you is that 15 years after 9-11, and remember the real war starts in 1979 when the Iranians illegally take over the American embassy in what Mark Bowden, in a, in a book uh, which he called Guest to the Ayatollah, uh, subtitle was uh, Iran's first attack in its war against America. So you could argue, I think accurately, that we're in the 37th year of the long war. We certainly 
were in conflict all through the 1980s in places like Lebanon. We were in conflict in the 1990s in uh, places like uh, Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia, uh, two American embassies that were bombed in East Africa, uh, the USS Cole, which was bombed in Yemen in 2000, and then 2001 occurred. And 15 years later, thousands of dead Americans, tens of thousands of severely wounded Americans, trillions of dollars spent and we're not winning we are in fact in a long slow strategic defeat we are being humiliated by our enemies and our political leaders are lying to us because how do you I mean how do you stand up and say you know guys the state of the union is we're getting beat they don't want to contemplate it so in the next eight weeks in this presidential campaign i hope both candidates will have the courage to admit that things aren't going the way we wanted them to, that we have to change pretty dramatically, and that uh, we owe it to the American people. We owe it to the men and women who risk their lives to figure out a strategy for victory, to figure out the way we can actually defeat our enemies, and to do what is necessary to give our children and grandchildren a safer and a more secure America. Um, Vicki Capozzi says, um, Fifteen years later, we as Americans still feel unsafe, especially with the current government, with all these additional ISIS terrorists. Um, when will we feel really feel safe again? I don't know. Uh, not until we defeat a lot of people. In fact, there's an article this morning that there are some 40 or 50 ISIS terrorists that loose in Western Europe. Um, I think you have to recognize this is a worldwide campaign. And it comes in many forms. I mean, the fact that the North Koreans, remember, the, the, the axis of evil was Iraq, which is now a mess, Iran, which we're now paying tribute to while it builds nuclear weapons, and is still to this day called by the State Department the chief funder of terrorism in the world, and North Korea, which announced yesterday that it had had its fifth nuclear test and which last week fired three missiles in, in direct violation of the United Nations Security Council regulation or resolution. So it's pretty hard to argue 15 years later that the axis of evil is still got two parts of the axis in pretty good shape. And the third part, Iraq, frankly, is largely dominated by a combination of uh, Sunni terrorists in the West under ISIS and people, Shias, who are allied with uh, Iran in the East. Uh, Roger DeVito, where do you think the point of no return is regarding our national security? and radical Islamic terrorism? Well, I think what we have to worry about, the moment that would change everything, is if they ever get a nuclear weapon. Um, the cost, think, think about our reaction emotionally to 3,000 Americans dying on 9-11. Now imagine in Cincinnati or Long Beach or Atlanta, a weapon going off that kills 300,000 and leaves another half million homeless, uh, radiation sickness, a variety of other problems. That would change America permanently. I mean, we would give up most of our freedoms in order to avoid having a second nuclear attack. So we have to really worry about how we defeat the forces who are trying to destroy us before they get the kind of weapons that actually literally could destroy our system as we know it. Gary Wood. How will we ever change the ideology of the Middle East? Or do we want to even try to change it? Well, I would say two things. I would say, first of all, we have to recognize they've got to change, not us. And so I don't think we can go in there and preach, why don't you change Tuesday? Second, though, as an example of what we never really got around to, there are remarkably few books published in Arabic. Now, during the Cold War, we had a very robust U.S. information library program. And it provided lots and lots of written material for people who wanted to learn. Uh, probably in 2001 at the latest, the U.S. government should have established a printing system. And we should have flooded the Middle East with books in Arabic that taught about democracy and freedom and free enterprise and private property and the rule of law. And we still should do that. Uh, during the Cold War, we had a very effective Voice of America program and Radio Free Europe program. We should be doing the same today. We should have a dominant ability to communicate both on the internet, on radio, on television, in movies, 
so that we could reach out across the entire Muslim world and offer people alternative information. Um, we ha clearly have to find a way to close down the madrasas that uh, teach no employable skill and instead teach an extreme form of Islam and provide uh, basic training areas to recruit uh, suicide bombers. And those are identifiable. Uh, the person who's actually had the most courage in this area is President al-Sisi of Egypt who went to Cairo University, the center of academic learning in the Islamic world, and said to a very large gathering of clerics, you have to modernize our religion. We cannot live on a planet where everybody's afraid of us. So for, for, this is, after all, a practicing Muslim. This is not some American politician telling us what he or she thinks we ought to think. Uh, and al-Sisi uh, was very clear and showed great courage, I thought. Tim Hayes, my son has done five tours for this country and put in danger for what? Well, my dad spent 27 years in the infantry. And I would say what your son did is he served the Constitution of the United States. He served the government of the United States. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, risk their lives every day. Uh, hopefully in the long run it's really worth something, but it would have been a disaster if we had not had courageous men and women willing to do their duty. You know, your duty is what the Commander-in-Chief says it is, what the Congress says it is. Uh, it's not optional. The military doesn't get to vote and say, well, I don't like that particular duty, let's get another one. Uh, your son did what he was assigned to do, he showed great courage in five rotations in. Uh, thank him for me, and I think thank him for every patriotic American for what he's done. Uh, Lee Walker, how would, in the context of modern technology, Teddy Roosevelt have responded to 9-11? That's, that's actually a great question. I love Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, he was actually a very cautious, careful man. Uh, I recommend to all of you who'd like to have a better feel for him, a little movie made in the 70s called The Wind and the Lion, in which Brian Keith is probably the best Theodore Roosevelt ever performed in a movie. Uh, and Sean Connery plays uh, a, a Moroccan uh, pirate who um, steals and kidnaps an American. It's based on a true story, but sort of with a Hollywood slant to it. Uh, there actually was a... Um, Greek born in Egypt with American citizenship named Petacaris, who was kidnapped by uh, uh, bandits in Morocco. And uh, the Rasuli, who was the head bandit, uh, demanded money. And during the 1904 campaign, Theodore Roosevelt said uh, as a campaign slogan, uh, I want uh, Petacaris alive or the Rasuli dead. Well, that fit American nationalism in that period. People loved it. Um, and of course, as soon as the election was over, they actually paid a bribe and got him out. We didn't go to war, we didn't invade, because Roosevelt was a very careful man, just as Ronald Reagan, by the way. Well, he built up the military. If you go back and look, he used it very carefully. He did not stumble into big wars, and he'd be appalled that we have been fighting this long. He would have thought it's absolutely the last thing you can do. So, um, Christine Carey is the last person. Do you think we need boots to defeat ISIS? No, I actually think if we designed it right, you could combine American air power and particularly a massive increase in drones. Um, and the reason I, I say drones is because what you want is continuing persistent surveillance. You want to be able to take, for example, a zone that ISIS is in, and you want to have uh, aircraft overhead 24 hours a day, and every time a vehicle starts to move, you kill it. And you announce that in advance. You say, look, if you're going to be against us, this is how we fought World War II. You know, we didn't, we didn't have rules of engagement that said, please check and see if they're good Germans or good Japanese. We just said, look, we're now at war. We're going to win the war. We're going to break your capacity to wage war. Uh, so I think if you combine that with strengthening local forces, the Kurds, for example, who are our allies, working with the Saudis, who are deeply opposed to ISIS, uh, I think we could defeat ISIS. But remember, ISIS is at most 10% of the problem. This is a worldwide campaign. It has two major components, international uh, radicals, Islamic supremacists, who use the internet to recruit everywhere, who engage in relatively small operations, and the Iranians, who 
who are extraordinarily dangerous and represent a totally different threat. But we have to have strategies for both. And then, frankly, we've got to find a way to deal with North Korea, which may be the most dangerous country in the world, totally isolated, uh, with a leader who uh, probably is not very much in touch with reality as we understand it, and with a gradually growing nuclear capability and the danger that one morning they're going to sell one of those to a terrorist group just because they want the money. Uh, so the world's complicated. We're faced with some real challenges. I think in the long run we will win because a free society has an enormous advantage in telling the truth, having a debate, looking for new leaders. Uh, we're much better off than dictators in that sense. But this is one of the greatest challenges in American history. We haven't done it very well yet, and we need a lot of conversation among ourselves to learn how to do it. Thank you very, very much. Except I think I failed to turn.